Mr. McGrory, I, too, am concerned about uh, the veracity of the scientific uh, assessment of, of Ann Maist. Um, but how many overall citations were there in the EPA draft report, draft assessment? To her, to her studies or her No. How many overall to any study? I don't know. I mean, the answer is 1,390. And you said there were 11 times she was cited. Uh, that's some three-quarters of a percent. Uh, do you think that if we can show that uh, on the American Resources Policy Network's sourcing that three-quarters of a percent of, of your sources have been debunked, that we should ignore everything else that your organization says? Let me, let me respond in terms of that. EPA itself seems to indicate some concern about the Kuiper's May study because they subjected it to a kind of a quasi-peer review. Um, so they did select it out. So they took care of that problem, at least in terms of the peer review. They did, they did take care of that problem. Um, you mentioned that we should let science guide us. Are you a scientist, sir? I am not. Are you an engineer? No. Are you an attorney with expertise about EPA procedures? No, I'm a policy analyst. Okay. I, you know, actually, I admire your background. It's very similar to my own, journalism, communications. But I don't understand why you have any expertise to speak on this matter. Do you want to illuminate me on that? Sure. Um, my um, interest in this issue and involvement in this issue dates back. I served in government, um, two presidential appointments to the Department of Defense in the Reagan administration, Secretary Weinberger, Secretary Carlucci, and then later went to the White House with uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. Um, I was responsible. You're, a, you're an expert in politics, the political expert. Again, I, I, have, I have respect for your profession. I just don't understand what you're adding in terms of the scientific assessment that you yourself say should guide us. At that time, I was uh, one of the issues, of course, the Soviet Union was the, was the concern, were strategic metals access. Nowadays, it's, it's China. The Cold War is over. And I was responsible for the statements on national security, many foreign affairs issues, um, and defense policy, both at DOD, where this issue was, was, was critical and important, and, and at the White House. Right, so my, my, the, the genesis of my interest and involvement dates back to that. So you are concerned about the strategic uh, effect if we don't have enough of these metals. I do understand that. Um, you did point out about a chilling effect on mining. Um, and I would like to ask Mr. Nastri, um, in, in re regards to the Chairman's question and your answer, are you concerned about environmental impact because of a chilling effect if the continued I, you know, the, the mining companies continue to say they are going to ask for a permit and don't. Is that why there is an environmental uh, damage here? And, and if, you, if, if not, if you want to clarify your, you know, or elaborate your answer to the Chairman's question about that? Sure. Oh, my sure. The real issue here is uncertainty and the impact that uncertainty causes. And I think Senator Murkowski said it well when she said uh, in a letter to Northern Dynasty and the Public Partnership that um, there is frustration, there is anxiety, uh, and all of this because of the uncertainty. And the uncertainty actually prevents a lot of investment for it to take place. We spoke to many organizations that said they would love to invest by creating jobs, by creating new processing facilities, but with the uncertainty that is there, they are not going to do anything. You also have a number of people that want to invest in the fishing industry, buy new boats, buy new nets. They too have an uncertainty. And so what happens is you have what I would argue is uh, ongoing degradation because there is paralysis. And so that was the, the manner in which I was referencing. So whichever way we go, we are better off making the decision now than continuing to postpone it if, if it is a clear decision. Absolutely. I think it is much better to provide that certainty. And as I described before, I believe that EPA could proceed under a set of 404 restrictions. The restrictions would provide the guidelines for companies to move forward to. It would actually improve uh, whatever it is they decided to do by letting them know what they have to do. One, one criticism of the EPA that I think is shared by Dr. Kavanaugh, if I read his, uh, his uh, uh, writings correctly, is that the assessment doesn't take into account new technologies that might um, minimize the risk to the environment. Uh, Mr. Nastri, what, is, is that a possibility that there could be new technologies the EPA simply can't take into account? Well. Having worked at EPA for a number of years, I can tell you they have mining engineers, they have people that worked in the mining industry. They are quite familiar with mining in general. And I, when I look at the uh, documentation that has been provided by the partnership, Pebble Partnerships' own uh, companies, they describe in detail mining plans. They talk about two types of operations, open pit and underground. There is really not a lot of 
um, variation that you're going to see other than the actual size in the technology. And from that perspective, the real question I think that people need to wonder about is, this is the resource of the world's greatest salmon fishery. Over 40 percent of red salmon supply come from this fishery. Can you imagine the uproar that would be caused if new unfounded or unproven technology were applied in some area like this, which is so globally significant, and something went wrong? Is this the area where you would actually try to put in new technology without having the absolute certainty that it's going to be fail safe? This is not an area that you experiment with. Okay. Thank you. And thank, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rothschild, if the EPA decided uh, to move forward with 404C action in Bristol Bay, does, that have, does it have the authority to do so, strictly speaking, as a legal matter? Well, with the caveat that I wasn't asked to talk about 404C, I can tell you that uh, EPA has not historically issued a preemptive 404C veto, so it's not exactly clear what uh, it would need to do to prepare a record for that. Uh, I do note that as early as this morning, um, Administrator McCarthy was quoted in the Washington Post as saying that with regard to the, the mine, any act that EPA would take would be carefully considered. There are significant natural resources in that area, along with significant economic resources. We've got to get that balance right. Okay. It's, it's that balance that really NEPA is intended to inform the decision making. Good. Good. Thank you. That's, that's helpful. Um, I want to uh, quote from a letter by Senator Lisa Murkowski on this. Uh, she uh, wrote on July 1, 2013, that at least as far back as November 3, 2004, Northern Dynasty Minerals asserted that the submission of permit applications was imminent. And then she goes on to describe how uh, this occurred again in 2000. Five and six, eight, nine, uh, ten, um, and right up to uh, most recently in June of 2013, the PLP representative said that you hope to have a project to take uh, into permitting this year. And she says, by failing to take the next step, by failing to decide whether to formally describe the project and seek permits on it, PLP has created a vacuum that EPA has now filled. Mr. Nastri, is this, does this context affect your assessment of the EPA's responsibilities here, the context of all of these uh, times that the, the companies have said they are going to seek a permit and then they, they pull back? Well, the agency is being responsive to those who actually requested they get involved, uh, those being the Alaska Natives, the residents, the commercial and sport fishermen, and a whole host of other groups. So the, I guess the lack of submission of a timely permit application that created the uncertainty, the confusion, and the anxiety has certainly contributed to where we are today. Had that been done, I'm sure we would not be here today. Um, but the fact of the matter is for EPA to respond to uh, various uh, residents and groups and so forth, this is the way that they respond. They have to look at the issue. I'd, li I'd like to note that there are some representatives of the Native tribes that requested the EPA look into this here today, and I'm honored to, that, they would, that they would make the trip. Um, just to elaborate a little bit further on that, Mr. Nastri, do you, so the, the, the fact that uh, it may be fairly unprecedented if the EPA were to go ahead with 404C action, but do you feel that this is a somewhat unprecedented situation with a company postponing, you know, bringing uh, to the, the brink uh, uh, that they are going to have a permit and then continuing to postpone it time and time again? Well, I think the area and the resource uh, is unprecedented in terms of the value and its importance, both from an economic perspective, from a jobs perspective, and as the cultural importance. And so in that light, I think it's important to address and provide certainty to those people. Um, but as far as, you know, people have said that this is a precedent, you know, as was said earlier, in the hundreds of thousands of permit applications for fill and dredge permits, the agency has only taken 13 times. And the issue of being proactive, I mean, here we are in the world's greatest salmon fishery left. If we are not going to be careful and protective of this, when would we be? And so that is why it is so important to address this issue, provide that certainty now to everybody involved. Well said, sir, and I will yield back the balance of my time.